haven't told you that yet, right? Um, and the thing that will replace the multiplication table at the level of the generators will also be a complete specification of the group. To figure out what that is, well, I guess we should start off with the multiplication table. Now, we can't write the multiplication table down, but we can do the following. We've got a continuous group, so we're going to make a couple of assumptions now. So let's imagine that we wanted to compose this group element, and I've, I've parameterized it by some coordinates x prime. Let's imagine that we wanted to compose that with t, and I parameterized this by some coordinates x. So the x's and the x primes, they may be angles of a rotation, they may be displacements of a translation, they could be rapidities of a boost. They are just labels for the transformation. Once I compose these two, I will get another generator of the group. And the first coordinate here will be a function of the coordinates that appear inside those two um, generators. Going all the way up to the nth coordinate Okay, so that's now how I write down my um, composition law. Are there any questions on that? Anyone who's a bit confused, not quite sure what I'm doing? Why is some of the arguments just function mm -hmm. Okay, well, over here, so, so if I've got this T, what do I have to do to get a transformation? I have to specify what I'm going to stick into these end slots, what coordinates I should evaluate this at to get a specific generator, Okay. Now, I have composed this group element with this group element. If I've composed those two group elements, okay, I will get another group element on this side. The group element that I will get will depend on both of the group elements that I've composed on this side of the equation. So what I will have to plug into the first argument of T will depend on both the X prime and the X. So this would be a function now of two N coordinates. N X's and nx primes. This only depends on nx primes, that only on nx's. Okay, does that help? Any other questions? Okay. <coughs> so now we will make um, a couple of um, assumptions. Yes. Sorry, who's... All, who's oh, yes. You mean over here? Yeah. This is a prime. Right. Yes. Okay, you happy with that? Good. Okay. So we're going to make an assumption now. And what we will assume is we will assume that these functions fi, so we've got fi of x1, x2, so on, xn minus 1 prime, xn prime. Um, we will assume that they are smooth functions of um, the xi and the xi prime. Okay? When, when you're making this assumption, you're actually focusing on a Lie group. Okay? And that's what we're doing here. We're focusing on a Lie group. Um, so we will assume that these are smooth functions of the xi and the xi prime. And we're going to make one more assumption. We are going to assume that the group element that you would get, if you set all of these coordinates to zero, would be the identity. Okay? And I guess that that makes a lot of sense because you can see, according to this rule over here, if we were to set alpha to naught, we've got e to the naught, which is a one. Over here, if we set AX, AY, and AZ equal to naught, we again get E to the naught, which is 1. So, so that's pretty natural, and it's consistent with the type of um, way we were writing down generators, group elements in terms of generators before. Okay, good. So let's see if we can say anything about these Fs. Well, I guess there is something we can say immediately. Let's say that we took 
um, this expression over here, and we evaluate it with all of the x primes equal to naught. If all of the x primes are equal to naught, then what is this statement saying? The identity multiplied by t. But we know what that is. That's got to be t. So what we could say is, if we have fi, we're now going to put all of the primes to zero. So we have got x1, x2, going all the way up to xn. And now I'm starting with the prime coordinates, and I put all of the prime coordinates equal to zero. So how many zeros are there here? n, and I put all of the prime coordinates to zero. So let me make that n better. There's a better n. This would be equal to xi. Okay? But we could also have chosen to set all of the x's to zero. If we set all of the x's to zero, then we would have learned that fi of naught, naught, going all the way up to here, naught, x1 prime, x2 prime, xn prime would have to be equal to xi prime. Okay, everybody happy with that? So I haven't said too much. I've just said what the multiplication rule must turn into if, I, if one of those elements that I'm multiplying is the identity. But now, this allows me to write down an expansion for, for f, at least when these coordinates x are small. And it looks like this. So if I think about it, so I want to write down fi. Do you think I could have a constant appearing? Think so? Let, let's put a constant in. So let's put a constant in, and we'll see if, if we actually allowed that or not. So we'll have a ci over there. Let's maybe have um, a di times by, let's say, a dij times by xj and maybe an eij times by xj prime plus, and we'll take care of the x squared terms in a moment. Let's put um, all of the x's equal to naught. If we were to put the x's equal to naught, that term would disappear, right? We'd be left with the constant plus the x prime, but we know that we should just be getting xi prime, okay? So from this equation over here, so, so let's call this one and two, it tells us that this will have to be equal to delta ij, the Kronecker delta, and it tells us that this constant over here must be equal to zero. Is everyone happy with that or not? Okay, so, so, so what am I doing? I'm just saying, let's put the x is equal to naught. If I put the x is equal to naught, that term disappears, so I'm left with these two terms, but I also know that f has to be equal to xi prime. So I have to kill the constant, that can't possibly be there, and this has to be a delta function, Kronecker delta. But I could also put the x primes to zero, and then I know I must get an xi. If I put the x primes to zero, well, here's a second argument to say that the c must be zero, and now dij would have to be equal to delta ij. Everyone happy with that? In exactly, okay, so, so I'm going to fix up my expansion now, so I shouldn't have the ci. That shouldn't be there. Um, I should just have an xi, and <coughs> I should have an xi prime. Good. So at this stage, I've, I've written down f to, to linear order. It has to look like that to be consistent with these two conditions. Now, what about at second order? We'll need the second order terms. Well, I guess I could have a term that looks like ci, j, k xj, xk prime. Uh, I guess I could also have a term like uh, dijk, xj, xk, and perhaps I could also have a term that looks like eijk, xj prime, xk prime. Now let's see, is this consistent with our two equations above? So let's look at equation number one. Well, in this equation, we set x prime to zero. If we set x prime to zero, that term goes away, so that's gone. So forget about that. That term is gone. That term is gone. So I'm left with x plus that. But in fact, I must only get x. So what that tells me is that term has to be equal to zero. 
in exactly the same way, if I was to set um, <coughs> x prime to zero, or x to zero, I could learn that that term also should not be there. So to second order in x and x prime, this is the expansion of f. There would, of course, be corrections to this. How large would those corrections be? They would be stuff like, um, well, well, it would be x squared, x primes, and maybe an x prime squared, x, stuff like that, that would start to contribute next. So I've dropped those terms. I'm assuming that x and x prime are small. OK. And then the next thing that I want to do, um, I'm also going to assume that my, my group element can be expanded around the identity. So now I'm going to start working in a specific representation. Let's say representation gamma. Um, and I'm going to expand this about the identity as follows. I must have 1 plus i x a t a. Okay? Now this would just be an infinitesimal um, transformation over here. So what is this t a? t a is my generator, right? So this would be the generator. So now the generator starts to make an appearance. And over here, I'm, okay, I should say that all repeated indices are summed. So I'm summing over the J and K. I'm summing over A here. Okay? And I can add in a term at order X squared, which might look like 1 half XA, XB, T, A, B. Now, you can see that I am contracting this T over here with x a x b and x a x b is symmetric under swapping um, the two x's so what that means is this is symmetric in a and b if i perform this contraction only the symmetric piece of t a b will survive so if i was doing the calculation and at some later stage i find something depends crucially on the anti-symmetric piece of t i've made a mistake because t's got to be symmetric so i want to make a note of that T is symmetric. Okay. Now that we've got that information, we can start to um, figure out what the generators will have to obey. <coughs> so I'm going to take my group multiplication law at the top of this board, and I'm just going to write it down and multiply it out. So at the top there, I've got um, coordinates x prime. So when I plug it into here, what I land up getting is 1 plus i x a prime t a plus 1 half x a prime x b prime t a b plus whatever. And this will now have to multiply into the generator of uh, the group element with coordinates x. So I'm going to use my expansion again, but now with coordinates x. So this multiplies into 1 plus i x a t a plus 1 half x a x b t a b. And let's just see what does this equal to. Well, the 1 times the 1, that's 